Long yeah, time. Long time. Long time. Yes. Um, Nick, you should have you should have started this a half an hour ago because everyone wants to say hi to everybody else. We haven't yes, yes. for such a long time. Hi, Nita. How are you doing? <laughs> Michelangelo. All right. <laughs> Ciao, All right, everyone. I think I see, I see way too much excitement for people. Um, right. So maybe actually we will um, pick up the, the, the slide and just like see each other for a little moment. I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> I felt a lot of excitement of long lost faces. <laughs> Um, great, welcome, welcome everyone, wherever you are. I think we're literally from um, from Europe to Asia, across Latin America, the Americas. So quite a lot of um, representatives. On that note, I think it would be really amazing since we're so many people to start writing in the chat. Um, that's a really cool way to communicate. So maybe write who you are, where you are actually calling in from um, and whatever comes to your mind. So let's keep that chat um, active and alive between us. And um, in your breakout rooms, you're going to have for sure as well more space to get to know each other and um, to converse a bit more about this really important topic of restaurants of the future. Um, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm Nikki Nikola, I'm one of the co-founders of the Social Gastronomy Movement. And this is the third out of a series of six dialogues that we've um, been building for the UN Food System Summit together with um, um, Griffin Foods. And this specific dialogue, we're actually co-creating and curating with um, Michelangelo and the Basque Neris um, <laughs> Center. So we're going to uh, explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but it's so wonderful. And I felt the excitement of people entering, of seeing old and new faces. I love the introduction emails that have been circulating prior as well of finding out about each other, but I'm actually going to address this important topic um, all together. We have more than 100 representatives, actually exactly 100 right now in this room. A few people will be a little bit late. And this is a space between friends, new ones, old ones. It's a space to really um, be honest about the future of our industry. Um, to look at the good and the bad sides, to look at what Corona did to us, um, but also to look at this future that we can reimagine together. It's a space um, where you can, it's off a record, basically. We're going to record the beginning of a conversation, the introduction. And once you're in your breakout rooms, it's Chatham House rules. So it, um, it's not recorded and um, anything that comes out is going to be content that comes out instead of... Um, quotes or anything that um, you would not want to be um, held accountable for afterwards. So really be honest and uh, bring your, your voice to the table. The social gastronomy movement is um, a global network of um, more than 160 organizations nowadays across all continents. And um, we foster collaborations. We really stand for a recipe of change of CCPs, connecting, collaborating and um, partnering. And I think, and I hope we're gonna come out with some beautiful partnerships after this dialogue as well. Um, we do believe that food can change the world and knowing the people in this room, I know you believe that as well. We can change the world and we can transform realities together. And this being said, I'm actually gonna set a few ground rules just for the dialogue right now um, in terms of principles. We welcome um, divergence and dissenting opinions. Show up, be present and open to creating this experience together. Speak and listen with truth and love. Agreeing or disagreeing with respect and kindness. And share what you know and try to learn with one another. This being said, I, um, I do wanna hand over to our amazing curator today, Michelangelo him and a team um, across the Basque Culinary Center, as well as um, our team, Janet, Maxi, and our entire social gastronomy team have been tirelessly um, working on actually making this happen today. So first of all, thank you all. And now welcome everyone and over to you, Michelangelo. Thank you. Can you hear me? All good? Uh, well, first, uh, I want to thank Nikki, I mean, like Nikki and the Social Gastronomy Movement to invite me here. I mean, like to be part of this uh, process. Um, it's been 
at some point tiring. Uh, I mean, like just to, to bring everybody together. Uh, Janet, I mean, like I want to thank Janet because it's been crazy, amazing working with you. I mean, like you are pretty good at structuring and organizing thoughts. Uh, something that I have to learn a lot. And I thank you very much for that. Uh, and the whole process of structuring this. Uh, a lot of the people here uh, know me. I mean, like some of people not. Uh, I'm currently a professor at the Basque Learning Center, uh, this university in San Sebastian, um, which means that I have, I mean, I'm lucky enough to live in this beautiful city, which is, is amazing, to be honest, for those that know the city. Um, but also I, have a, I haven't been a professor, of course, all of my life. Uh, I've been working uh, in social development and gastronomy. So I have kind of like a little of everything. My work today essentially is to explain to you, I mean, like briefly, uh, what is this about and why, why we're here. I will try to explain, um, of course, I mean, like what are the BRs? I mean, like how do we think about this, uh, these 10 conversations, you see? But essentially, I mean, like the dialogue title is pretty clear, Restaurants of the Future, the Powerhouse for Inclusion, Prosperity and Resilience. Um, we all here work and we have some level of relationship with, with food and with restaurants. So we have some level of acknowledgement, uh, acknowledgement of the challenges that we have these days. It is clear that the pandemic uh, hit us badly. Um, Spain, for example, we expected that one from every four restaurants will not open, restaurants or bar, we are not, it will not be open after the pandemic. That's huge if we consider that this is uh, a quarter of an industry that represents, together with tourism and hotel, about 20% of the entire GDP of one of the largest economies in the in the European Union. So that's something like is, is huge for this country and we're looking for a, a deep recession and a complex situation into the future, you see. Um, but also, I mean, like, although the, the, the I mean, like, situation is bad, uh, I think that, I mean, not everything was caused by the pandemic. I think the pandemic also gave us the opportunity to see how fragile is the industry, right? I mean, like, what which challenges we already had, I mean, like before uh, the pandemic. Um, so this could be a good opportunity to all of us somehow, I mean, like uh, trying to use this to challenge the status quo and to try to reframe, to restructure uh, the industry for the future, you see? So what the question is like, what is next? I mean, like what does the restaurant of the future looks like, you see? How can we collectively rethink the way restaurants operate, you see, toward society? I mean, like how can we do something and take this opportunity, you see? I will give uh, uh, some data here. I mean, like a little more data to see the impact that the restaurant business has. Uh, that for me was pretty interesting. We already know this. And of course, all of us, we have this information. But for example, for 2019 in the US, uh, the, restaurants, the restaurant industry, I mean, generates a revenue of 864 billion US dollars and employed approximately 15 million people, you see. It's the second largest private employ employer. That's huge, you see. And just to have an idea, the industry revenue has uh, was greater than the agricultural airline and motion picture, motion picture industry together. You see, this is in the U.S. We're talking about huge, I mean, like huge numbers, you see. And an interesting fact about this is that the average bottom line, you see, in the industry was 5%. You see, it was like only, only 5%. Um, we can just take this information and we can analyze it in two ways. You see, we can think about it like, yes, the end profit is quite low if we compare it with the amount of effort that entrepreneurs have, I mean, like to reach that. But we, we can also think about that the industry is some sort of like a machine for wealth uh, redistribution, you see? I mean, it's a lot of what the inputs, I mean, like it goes out again to society, you see? Um, it's estimate that the impact uh, is the economic impact is about 2.5 trillion in the U.S. You see through wages, supply chains, providers, rent. So actually, the impact is huge. You see, it's not only about sales, but it's about what we do. We do with that. You see, it's kind of like a some sort of like a tool to 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 gather wealth and to re redistribute that into society again. So it's kind of like okay. So what is the role of the restaurant? And how can we take this opportunity? You see, so. Taking this situation, I mean, like this context, uh, we are taking, like Nikki said, the opportunity with the, food UN, the UN Food System Summit to address these challenges. And we designed this, um, we designed, I mean, we thought about these 10 fundamental conversations or breakout rooms, you see, to tackle, to see if we can achieve concrete actions uh, to achieve in the next three, four, five years, you see. Uh, beyond, of course, the UN opportunity, I mean, like this is also a good opportunity, again, to maybe to build a stronger community and to understand that we're all here together. Um, 
So now I'm going to spend a little about the breakout rooms, um, about how we distribute this 10 in total. And the first one, I mean, like the one that we, I mean, like the one, how we design it is like the first one is beyond, without any particular order, of course, is the chef beyond the restaurant, you see. Um, it seems like in the past few years, I mean, restaur uh, restaurateur chefs become like politicians, social and community leaders, activists, influencers, I mean, like with a big microphone, with the capacity to reach to a lot of people, you see. And in some cases, um, I mean, like chefs become somehow an unreachable rock star, you see. I mean, like a fundamental key part of the value chain. I mean, like how this happened? I mean, like why this happened, right? So now the question is like, uh, we are going to take the time to reflect on this behavior. I mean, like uh, what will be the, the posture and the role of the chef after the pandemic? You see, like, are we reflecting on this? Um, and this, for this breakout room, we have uh, amazing Luciana Bianchi that joined us, uh, is a close friend. And it's so wonderful to have her here. Um, leading this area you see for number two is what is the role of the restaurant or society and planet um i mean like what is the responsibility of this like i said at the beginning of this kind of like transfer this this tool to transfer to, to to transfer wealth you see to bring wealth from one side to another you see uh how can we help restaurants to embrace social ecological and financial matters at the same level in order to become truly sustainable you see what are we missing here uh, a restaurant is part of an ecosystem. Which stakeholders and actions are key uh, for this to happen? You see, I mean, it's a very complex question. For this, we have uh, Camila Saila leading this conversation. Um, I mean, like Camila is the person that is, I've been like sharing like half of my career with her, and I, I mean, I cannot think anybody else that can talk about this. I mean, like this, this duality, this, this, this responsibility that the, the restaurant has. So, thank you for coming, for being here. Number three, we have industry versus craftsmanship. I mean, like the role of the industry. Um, for, for me, this one is pretty interesting because for me, I see like there's a, like a, a big world like separating like industry and craftsmanship. And, today, and, and, and I don't understand why they don't work together. You see, if you think about it, many of the technologies and even some of the products that we use uh, within high-end cuisines, for example, uh, they come from industry. You see, if you think about it, the whole process and equipment from sous vide bags, from cooking sous vide, sous -vide you see? and many others, you see. Um, and we can see that their efficiency can actually enhance performance and, and, and keep quality in the production of, of a little more handcraft uh, production, you see. So how can we make them work a little closer together? How can, how can we build a bridge, a closer bridge, you see? And I think that there is a lot of entrepreneurs and leaders doing already that. So how can we focus in that direction? You see, we have, for that VR, we have Isascom Surbito, which is, uh, is a professor at the Basque Community Center. I mean, like responsible of the entrepreneurship and innovation area in the academic side, uh, AKA my boss. So it's wonderful to have her here. And I, I love to have her here. And she has a very different, I mean, like very, a lot of, I mean, like a, a very good profile for that. Um, BR4, we're gonna talk about responsible consumption, uh, planetary health and sustainable through our choices. Um, so one day I heard, in a presentation for the uh, uh, Nordic Food Movement presentation, I, I heard a very interesting phrase that it was like, this gastro revolution is an informal movement led by, uh, led by consumers, you see? Because at the end, consumers are the one, uh, I mean, like their choices will somehow condition uh, the type of offer and the, and the products that we're going to offer to them, right? So once again, I mean, like addressing this issue is extremely important. How can we ensure conscience among consumer choices. I mean, how, which lessons learned can help, help us to lead consumers to the right products and trends, you see. For that, we have Chef Alejandra Schrader. Uh, she has a crazy profile. I mean, like she's been in architecture, urban planning, nutrition. She's launching a book right now, the Low Carbon Cookbook. So she's, I mean, like very cool profile there. BR5, um, human rights along the restaurant value chain. I mean, this this is a very interesting topic. I mean, like from food producer to food delivery. I mean, it seems the world is moving so fast that we forget so many people in the process. Um, so how can we mitigate that? I mean, how can we place ethics at the core of our of all our decisions? You see, uh, could technology be enough to help uh, to help us mitigate this challenge? I mean, like how can we do something with that? For this VR, we have amazing Sara uh, Roversi, I mean, like head of the Future Food Institute. I mean, like, um, 
She has, a, again, a crazy uh, background. I mean, like amazing background, like an admirable everything that you've been doing from entrepreneurship to not profit organization. Um, for BR6, uh, this is a special topic. I mean, like all of them are pretty important, but this is actually one that I personally, like a professor, I think that this is really, really important to tackle, which is reward systems. You see, and lists. You see, I'm coming from the restaurant world. Suddenly, I'm here working with so many future entrepreneurs and leaders. You see, and sometimes I'm seeing them that they are inspired sometimes by the wrong values and professional role models, you see? And, and, and I think, we think, all of, 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 I think most of people think that reward systems, I mean, like the list from 50 best to Michelin to everybody has a big responsibility to shape uh, the values of the leaders of the future. I mean, which choices these people will, uh, will take in the future, which fundamentally will, um, will have any, I mean, good or bad repercussions into the industry, you see? Um, for this, we have How We Can. I mean, like a uh, very interesting journalist. I just met him a couple, like a week ago. I had a very brief conversation with him and it was like really happy to hear him. I mean, like everything that he's saying, I love, I mean, like the, his values and the vision that he's going to bring, bring to this conversation. So thank you very much for joining the dialogue. For BR7, uh, ethics versus aesthetics. We're talking about packaging. We're talking about food waste. It is true that we eat through our eyes. That's, that's, that's something. I mean, aesthetics are really relevant to, I mean, for our um, gastronomic offers, to everything, I mean, to promote our products. But I mean, like my experience is sometimes we leave aside, I mean, like aesthetic is more important than the, the, the product itself. Actually, we've seen these challenges in supermarkets. We've seen these challenges in the increasing delivery and takeaway, and takeaway industries. So, I mean, like, I mean, how can we just connect those? You see, how can we connect these two together so we can just keep offering the best products? I mean, like the most beautiful and beautiful products, but being a little more ethic about the way that we use the products, um, the raw materials, and of course, packaging and all that. For that, we have Eva Goldborn, that she's a specialist on um, food waste, and she's an expert in this area and um, I mean like she will bring so many so many good information to the to the to the table among of course about the participants. BR8 uh, and this is kind of like a new topic for me. I mean like in the sense that we're talking about this one we, we, we will talk about data driven business decisions. I mean like so much heart and passion within the industry and there is so much so many tools mostly these days that we can we can have access to so much data that can help us to make better decisions you see. Um, but I, one of the things that I just realized in this process is that it's not only about the tools, it's not only about the software, but it's also about the person. You see, like, it's also about, I mean, like, what level of education, what is the level, I mean, like, uh, how, how open is the person to include this process within the, within the um, I mean, like, within the operation? I mean, like, how to implement this? I mean, how can we cut the mark, I mean, the gap there, you see? For that, we have James Hacken, uh, a person that is... Uh, um, I mean, like that actually did a class for, uh, for our students at the faculty uh, here at BCC, and it was really crazy amazing the amount of information that he's bringing to the table uh, beyond a marketeer and a strategist uh, and a great friend too. BR9, uh, this is actually a very important topic for me on my heart, which is uh, leading uh, people uh, in a dynamic era. I mean, like a dynamic generation. Um, it seems like I mean, like, it's always about, I mean, like the producers, about the food, the quality and all that, the consumer, we, we, we tend to forget about, I mean, like, I mean, who will be leading these companies into the future? I mean, how the industry has been changing in the past years, you see? I mean, like, talking about priorities, talking about objectives, you see? So, so we have, a, like, a, a big, big challenge about leading people, uh, mostly because this is a very completely different generation these days, you see? And also because we're also facing a change in the operational structures. And we're gonna to have to understand that we're gonna to have to reskilling a lot of people. You see automation is there, uh, robotics is there. So it's gonna be addressed in BR8, but it's going to have a big impact in the way that we are uh, leading uh, our collaborators, our teams, you see. Also, we have big challenges still on sexual harassment, on organizational behavior, you see. So how to tackle this? For that, we have amazing uh, Anais Iglesias, also here from Basculinari. Together with Isaskum, I mean, we co-lead the entrepreneurship and innovation area. I, I feel so lucky to have these two people working. I mean, like working. I mean, like working with them. So it's crazy. I learn every second 
uh, in my life. It would be great to that. And last and but not least, uh, number 10 is the nightmare, of the, the nightmare of the numbers, which is insane. I mean, like, I think the name uh, is clear. I mean, like this, this, this VR is pretty clear financial modeling. I mean, like, uh, we know that a lot of, a big part of the industry is financially fragile. Um, from inventory management expenses, product sourcing and investment decisions. I mean, like, it's crazy. I mean, like how fragile uh, it, it is the industry in this area. I mean, the large turnover of restaurants is an indicative of how challenges can be owned and manage a restaurant, you see? So how can we help to try to identify the challenge and try to mitigate them, you see? For that we have, I don't know if we can have a better person than Pedro Silveira. He has 20 years experience working in financial sector in Brazil, and he has his he co-runs a restaurant group called A Life that they manage 35 restaurants and bars in Brazil. Welcome and thank you for joining the the team, the, the group. So I hope I mean like that. This is uh, I mean like of course I've been talking so much. I hope that uh, you don't fall asleep. So we can hope that each of these conversations can we tackle them uh, and to achieve like concrete actions. I know that it's going to be very difficult to achieve those actions. Um, so we hope that we can at least have something that we can uh, as much tangible as possible so we can just uh, figure out how to work together in the next uh, short round, short time, three, five years to work together. So now, uh, after me talking and talking and talking and reading all this, I uh, hope that, I mean, it like, was a little value for all of you. I would like to handle uh, the microphone to say something to a person that is very, is quite important for me. I mean, like in my professional life which is Klaus Meyer, um, about 10 years ago, something like that. I, I, was, being, I was working and working on the, on the high-end sector, um, restaurants like Mugaritz, Rale, and many other places. And, and he kind of like changed completely my, uh, my perspective of food. I realized that the food was, I mean, like beyond, I mean, the dish at the plate that you can provide in a, in a restaurant. It changed completely my, 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 my perspective. And that's one of the reasons that I'm actually teaching entrepreneurship and innovation at the Basque United Center, they had this opportunity. So I'm super happy to have him here uh, to say a few words just to uh, jump before before we jump to the conversation. Uh, so yeah, I will just handle the microphone to Klaus mm -hmm. and thank you for mm -hmm. coming, all of you. Thank you for your kind words, uh, MC, and, and thanks for, for trusting me to say a few words uh, at the very beginning. Um, I, I've been asked to, to share a, a few re reflections and uh, maybe a few learnings from uh, the, the most recent uh, COVID-19 uh, tragedy and also uh, say a few, I guess, initial words today about what I think uh, COVID-19 and uh, the whole uh, climate crisis uh, and, and everything that happened in this industry for the previous 20 years, what that will mean to... Um, the role of the chef in 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 the, in the future, and I will do that as briefly as I as I possibly can. As some of you may be familiar with, uh, I am my life is divided. Part of me is working in the in the for profit world. I run, or I kind of I'm a co-owner of a, of a pretty substantial restaurant uh, group in uh, Denmark, in the northern part of Europe, in a resourceful part of the world. Uh, and then also I am the founder of the Melting Pot Foundation that uh, runs operations, educational operations in Bolivia, as well as in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, New York City. And to start with that, I mean, uh, Corona uh, almost uh, uh, destroyed us in uh, Bolivia, uh, in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and a little uh, miracle happened, namely that uh, an entire community um, helped the Brownsville Community Culinary Center through COVID-19 by trusting us to receive uh, uh, significant funds to turn the school and the cafeteria into an emergency kitchen, suddenly providing daily meals for more than 3,000 people for half a year and, and connecting with both donors and uh, community members in a very particular way. But the, back to um, the, the privileged country of Denmark, um, uh, as many of you who are in this industry, I, had, uh, I was part of a group of restaurants with um, a lot of people sent home and, and a lot of money pouring out. 
um, but also um, I had very resourceful people, colleagues that were off the hook. Uh, it was a situation where um, a lot of uh, people in the community, in the society were hungry for and or even desperate for entertainment. Uh, it was a period where there was, because nothing was happening, there was an almost uh, seamless uh, or effortless access to media exposure. And then there was a need for the chef or the restaurateur to be a transmitter of hope and uh, optimism, somebody who could put a smile on people's faces and, 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 and connect uh, in, in spite of everything. So what we did um, with uh, a, a decent amount of success in admires in Denmark was to, after having contemplated on it for eight years, within 24 hours, we created a a cooking, a daily cooking show that was for free for everyone, where we invited uh, chef friends, but also uh, national celebrities to participate in this extremely um, informal, uh, handheld um, television or kind of live stream show that, that uh, to my big surprise, achieved uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers and um, was a beautiful experience for me and my colleagues and, 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 and even more people. Uh, another thing we did was to, at the moment where you couldn't go into the theater or cinema and you couldn't uh, come into a restaurant, we created with a cinema, a drive-in uh, bio and uh, drive-in cinema and restaurant so that uh, in the span of 30 uh, days where everything was closed down, we had uh, more than 20,000 people eating uh, our food from the hands of our chefs and uh, watching cinema in their private cars and having a, a moment of togetherness that was very particular in a very particular period of our modern civilization. A little bit later, when we were to open restaurants, we were not sure what it was all about. So we teamed up in a strategic alliance with a greenhouse producer. And, and because of the situation, got an extraordinary allowance from the city of Copenhagen to put up those greenhouses outside of Two of our restaurants in Copenhagen, and and that was a very, it was a very Instagrammable moment to sit in a greenhouse for three four people and being served an amazing meal by a, a wonderful chef. So that was the greenhouse experience. And 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 lastly, when summer came, uh, all the festivals were were closed down, and um, so I had, we had a lot of energy that was for no use. So we decided to create our own micro festival in a in an almost abandoned. Um, very unimportant uh, city, the northern part of Denmark. And then we you know, wrote almost a personal letter to all the in inhabitants in that uh, part of the country and asked them to help us create the best picnic in the entire world. Of course, it was, a, it was just an aspiration, but uh, the outcome was absolutely amazing. And it taught us a lesson about how to see the miracle uh, in the everyday life. And, and also it taught us about the power of uh, getting together with your immediate neighbors. So the whole, the whole Corona experience, uh, besides uh, taking a lot of money and a lot of resources out of our situation, it also, uh, because of these uh, uh, initiatives, gave, gave us a lot of new friends. Uh, it refreshed our brand. Uh, it even created a little profit besides the losses that we had in in, in the usual businesses and, um, and it gave us some learnings that have truly helped us beyond the COVID-19. A few words, a few final words about um, what I think uh, is um, the, the role of the chef uh, beyond the kitchen and beyond COVID. Um, I think we learned that, uh, we learned another reason uh, to connect, uh, I mean, another reason besides the climate change reason to connect at, uh, at deeper levels um, with stakeholders around us to build local resilient communities. If we didn't know that that was important before, now without tourism, we all know that this is extremely important for our businesses and beyond. Then I think we are all getting the point that uh, we are coming from the chef as some sort of dominant factor in an industry or in a, in a, in a community. Uh, someone who might be trapped in a 50 best game, a, a Michelin star, a white guide, uh, some sort of global popularity contest to now facing that what is important more than 
anything is that you ask yourself, how can you as a chef or as a restaurant be of service where you are? Uh, we learned that uh, cooking is not about, it, it is not about being an alchemist or a, a staff fucker. It is to be a steward of the earth. Um, and a lesson that I learned during Corona was that uh, we have gotten to the point where chefs are so important that uh, as stewards of the earth, we can be the ones who are reaching out to, our, to other very powerful people with a strong voice in our communities and ask them to stand by us shoulder by shoulder and basically together be uh, the voices of our planet. Thank you. Klaus, thank you so much. Um, and I think there's real stories of resilience in, in that response. Um, and that's exactly the title of our uh, restaurant of the future. Inclusion and resilience are part of our industry. So with no further ado, we're a little bit behind schedule. We will jump into our dedicated breakout rooms now. So um, as you know, the, this group was carefully selected um, and curated for the group to be really diverse and bring different angles and sometimes as well a bit of cognitive diversity so people that don't work with the industry necessarily that can cross-pollinate. So what's going to happen now, you will get a little sign, depending on the device that you are actually using, you will get a sign, a pop-up to join the breakout room you've been assigned to, or you have to go scroll to your left-hand side to click into it. And some devices even pull you automatically, so you'll disappear. The facilitators um, are going to receive you in the room. Most of you met already through the introduction emails, actually, so that was exciting to see. Um, however, do take the time to also quickly know who is in the room. We did lose a few people <laughs> because we had a bit of a technical glitch at the beginning. Um, so for those that know that some people couldn't get in at the beginning, this is fixed and um, they can sign up. There's always going to be someone in the main room. So whoever um, drops out, comes back, and there's going to be the social astronomy team that will uh, reassign you to your room um, and basically help you with any technical issues you might have. Um, with no further ado, I wish everyone a wonderful dialogue and I cannot wait for the results. We'll get about three key results, actions and outcomes from each group. So happy discussion. Uh, we'll be weaving through the rooms as well in case the rooms need any support. So um, let us know if you have any problems and with no further ado, have an amazing dialogue.